Okay, here we go. This is the fifth moment of the Hemshech. It's been a long journey. And if you've traveled with us on this entire trip, you know that it hasn't been easy. And the classes have not been perfect. Um, I, much of the material I feel like I was able to explain clearly, but some of it was quite involved, particularly the last shia that I gave, which was, as you know, quite long. This is the last Maimir, and I believe that a part of this new Maimir that we're going to be learning um, was included in the Baruch Shasanisim in, um, in Sif Hey and Vov that we learned in the previous Shir. Although I have no intentions of going back to the last Maimed, I want to go forward. Before we start this Maimed, I want to make an observation. Look at the Dibera Maschel. Vayemir Hashem al Moshe, Re'ei Nesaticha Lekim Lefadei, Va'aren Achicha Yiyeh Neviyach. This Maimed, at least the beginning and the end of it, is based on a Maimed from the Rebbe Rashab from Tafre Shayan Zayin from 1917, from February of 1917. Now, this Maimed is very famous. So famous, in fact, that the Rebbe actually discussed it in the year Tav Shendalad Mem in 1984, when he said this Maimed again, Vayemir Hashem el Meisha, Re'eine Satich Lakim Lafare. I'll explain to you what I mean when I say this. The way my modern work is that a Rebbe says a Maimed, and in most cases when you say a Rebbe says a Maimed, you mean the Alta Rebbe, and all the later Rabbeim would repeat the same Maimed, with the same beginning, the same questions, the same discussion, and tweak it, change it a little bit, or enhance it, or clarify it, or do all of the above. So when you talk about a Maimed, which repeats itself numerous times from either the same Rebbe or from various Rabbeim, on some level it's the same Maimed. The same Maimed which was said on this occasion, and on that occasion, and on the third occasion, Although, of course, in Beis HaMedesh, Belechidesh, each time a Maimed is said, it's said differently. And the origin of this Maimed, at least as far as we know, and as much, in as much as it relates to what I'm about to say, is Tafri Shayin Zai, 1917. And this happens to be uh, the 100th anniversary, of course, of that year. Now we're holding 2017, Tafri Shin Ayin Zayin, as opposed to Tafri Shayin Zayin. Uh, the Rebbe Rashab said a Maimed, and a few weeks later, the Tsar fell. The case in Nikolai, I think two or three weeks later, the Tsar fell. And from February until, um, I guess, November, there was a uh, Duma, there was a Senate, and there was a democratic system of government in Russia, which the Rebbe Rashab supported, and the Rebbe Rashab told Hasidim to go vote, as, as is well known. So... In 1984, Tafshin Mem Dalet, the Rebbe said this Maimed, briefly, in a shorter version. And after the Maimed, the Rebbe said that in Tafre Shayin Zayin, in 1917, when the Rebbe Rashab said this Maimed, people who were Mesim Lev, Lachol Prat, people who were attentive to every detail in the life of the Rebbe, saw how, in conjunction with this Maimed, the Zar fell. Because in this Maimed, a very unusual idea is introduced. It says, Nesatiha lekim lepare. Meshe Rabbeinu was given to pare as a lekim. And the idea, one of the ideas that this Maimed talks about is the idea that a tzaddik sometimes has a koyach to destroy a klipa, to destroy an evil, even when it's in its full power. Nesatiha lekim lepare. Meshe Rabbeinu was able to destroy pare, not when he was weakened and exhausted and and waning, but in his full might. So the Rebbe Rashab said the Maimed, and Chassidim understood that the, the Maimed was saying that a tzaddik, a Rebbe, Nasib Yisrael, has a koyach to destroy a clip and, and full of its koyach. And the Rebbe himself acknowledged that the consequence of that Maimed was the fall of the Tsar. And in 1984, the Rebbe said the Maimed and made the same point explicitly. So there's a sefer called Yedishke, which is published and available, which was printed in the last 20 years or so, which talks about the history of Chabad in Russia over the decades of the Cold War, decades of the Soviet Union, and the Rebbe's influence in Russia. 
it's a profound, it's a powerful book, it's a very big book. And there's a section about the miracles of the Rebbe. And this episode that I just described is in that book. And it says the name of a man, maybe his name was Soslov, I, I, maybe I'm, I, I didn't look it up before I came to class today, but the name of a very, very prominent intellectual in the Soviet Union who died shortly after the Rebbe said the Maimir in Memdal in 1984. So when I looked at this Maimir, which the Rebbe said in 1955, Tavshin Tezvav, I was immediately curious uh, what happened in 1955 that would explain the Rebbe saying this Maimir. Or to say it backwards, if the Rebbe said this Maimir, there must have been, as they say in Yiddish, Nayas, something must have happened. And I asked around, I'm not going to say I asked a thousand people, but I asked a number of people who uh, are old enough to know and are the kinds of people who paid attention to this kind of detail, and nobody was able to help me and explain to me what happened at that time as a consequence of this Maimir. So I went online and I googled. <laughs> and here's what I discovered. The Rebbe said this Maimir on Mavarcha uh, Mochei Shvat, which was Chov Ches Shvat, which is January 22nd in 1955. In February 1955, that means a few weeks after, two weeks after, a man named Malenkov, Malenkov, who was seen as the successor to Stalin, was basically deposed. And Khrushchev took the reins of power in the Soviet Union. And you don't have to trust me, you can look it up yourself. And it's quite compelling, it's quite interesting. Um, that the Rebbe says a Maimir, a person who's seen as a continuation to Stalin falls. And what's curious to me is that nobody really picked up on it. Now, maybe, I'm not in the know, in 1955 I was negative ten and a half. I wasn't born. So I obviously don't remember this. Um, but from the few people that I asked, I was not able to find anybody who appreciated the relationship between the saying of this Maimon and something that happened in the Soviet Union. And of course, everybody is familiar with the story of Hura, which happened two years earlier on Purim in 1953. We were at the very end of the Purim Fabrengen. The Rebbe suddenly told the story of Hura. I'll, I'll tell the story, even though the story has been so, told so many times. Um, that it was near the end of the Fabrengen. And uh, as I've heard from people who were witnesses, the Rebbe, when he would say a Maimir Chassidus, you knew before that a Maimir Chassidus was coming. Because his whole countenance would change. He would become very, very serious. And the, literally the color in his face would change. And you knew that a Maimir was coming. In those early years, my modern were either at the very, very beginning of the Fabrengen or close to the beginning of the Fabrengen, very close to the beginning of the Fabrengen. And that year, Purim, the Rebbe said a Maimir early in the Fabrengen. And uh, it had never occurred that the Rebbe should say a Maimir twice in the same Fabrengen. Late in the night, maybe two or three in the morning, the Rebbe suddenly took on that countenance, that cluster upon him, that appearance, which was typically evident preceding a Maimir Chassidus. Because the Rebbe had never said twice, a Maimir twice in one Fabrengen at that point, it seemed odd, nobody knew what was going to happen. And suddenly the Rebbe told a story, began to tell a story. And the story that he told was that during this period of democracy that I described a couple of minutes ago, uh, the Rebbe Rashab advocated and requested that all Chassidim should go and vote to support the democratic idea, which of course lasted about nine months until the communists took over. They made the revolution, and then it took them years. It was a terrible civil war, as the history is well known. Anyway, so there was an election. And there was an old chassid who heard that the Rebbe Rashab said to go to vote. So voting became to him a sacred task. It became fulfilling a mission of the Rebbe. So he went to the mikveh, and he put on his Shabbos clothes, he put on his godly, he's doing a hirah from the Rebbe. This fellow knew as much about politics as I know about the moons around Jupiter. He knew nothing about politics. Um, so he said to the Chassidim, what am I supposed to do? So they all told him, just do whatever we do. And there was some kind of a local election. People actually voted by the raise of fingers, I believe. And then the votes were tallied, and the victor was determined. And once that was established, they began to say hooray in Russian. Hooray. And in Russian, you don't say hooray, you say hurrah. Hurrah. So everyone screamed, hurrah. And this chassid, who knew nothing of this world, also screamed hurrah. 
but he didn't know what hura meant. So he said hura with incredible passion. Hura. Now the Rebbe didn't interpret, but in Hebrew, hura means he is evil. The Rebbe didn't spell that out, but it was quite obvious. The Rebbe told this story in a very, very, very serious tone. And then when he got to the punchline, if I understand the events correctly, the Rebbe pointed in each direction with his hands, and he said, Hura! And there's actually a couple of pictures. There's no audio tape of this Fabrengen, unfortunately, but there is vi- pictures, photos. And you could see the Rebbe pointing in each direction, and at the end of the story, when he gets to the punchline, the Rebbe has a very big smile on his face. But, again, based on people who were present, the spirit, the tone in which the story was told was very angestrengt, very, very serious, and the Rebbe pointed in each direction, and he said, Hura! Hura! Several times. And again, I wasn't there, but what I understand is that the Hasidim understood that they should repeat after the Rebbe, and all the Hasidim said, Hura! 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 And then within a very short time, the Rebbe said a second Maimed, al kein Kodal Yamele Purim, this Maimed is edited, the Rebbe edited the Maimed in 1991, Tafshin Nalef, some 38 years after the event. And in the Psachdov, introduction to the Maimed, they actually wrote that the recitation of this Maimed had to do with the death of Stalin. And the Rebbe looked over that Psachdov and left it in, which meant that the Rebbe, 38 years after the fact, acknowledged that when he said that Maimed, he was doing the same kind of thing as a Maimed like this. The Rebbe says a Maimed Chsidis, and he defeats a Klippa when it's in its full force and its full strength. I heard, I think I read, that Reb Shmuel, and from somebody else I heard that it was a different chassid, uh, Rabbi Kazanovsky, as the Rebbe told the story, as the Rebbe told the story of Hura, in that incredibly serious tone, um, a, an elder chassid turned to a younger chassid and said in Yiddish, er jetzt avek Stalin, which means in plain English, the Rebbe is finishing Stalin as we speak. Uh, Stalin died, uh, if not precisely at that moment, within a day or two. Now remember, this was at one of the worst moments in the Soviet history because after the war, after World War II, Stalin became more and more paranoid and more and more evil. And it was the winter of the doctor's plot, you know, the end of 52, the beginning of 53. And we know today that Stalin had plans for uh, exterminating the Jewish people, Rachman al-Itzlan, of, of doing in Russia what Hitler had done in all of Europe and parts of Russia. And Stalin died, and all this fell to pieces. So it was an incredible mess. Everybody knows that story. This is a Maimed, which is less than two years later. I don't know why the Rebbe said this Maimed. I, it's very hard for me to imagine that this was just coincidental. In other words, in my mind, without knowing for sure, I'm certain that if the Rebbe said this Maimed, there was a reason. And like I said, I googled, I looked online, and I found something very, very significant that happened in conjunction with this Maimed. Is what I'm saying true or false? I really don't know, but I'm sharing with you. So even if what I'm saying about this Maimed is untrue, but what I told you about 1917 and 1953 and 1984, Tav Shirei Shayin Zayin and Tav Shirei Gimel and Tav Shirei Mem, certainly is true because the Rabbim themselves acknowledged that the recitation of a Maimed had a koyach to defeat a klipa. And like I said, in each one of these Maimodim, you have a little section which discusses the idea that there is evil in the world, that a tzaddik has a koyach to destroy an evil even when it's in its full power. So I wanted to open the shiurim on this maimed with this introduction. And now, as we typically do, we're going to go to the middle of the maimed. Turn to the bottom of page Samachal. That's where we're starting today. V'ha'in yinu. Let me give you an introduction. This is the fifth Maimed in a series, in Hemshech of Maimodim. What is the series about? The series is about what is considered one of the most familiar and uh, philosophically intense and precise series, Hemshechim of Maimodim and Hasidus. It's the topic that's called Das Elyon and Das Tachtein, or Yehud Elo and Yehud Tato. Or more precisely, yesh, ayin, yesh. This sugi can be traced all the way back to the Alter Rebbe. You have it, my mother, with the Alter Rebbe, yesh, ayin, yesh. If I'm not incorrect, by the Alter Rebbe, it's quite concise. The idea begins to be developed by the Mittler Rebbe, and then it goes on from there. Each one of the Rebbeim have involved 
essays on this topic of Yesh Ayin Yesh. Um, the Rebbe Rashab has it in Samach Tes at great length and has it in Ayin Vov, in Ayin Vov at great length, besides for the fact that you also have it Bekitzid in Ranat and in Samach Vov and many other places as well. The previous Rebbe developed the version of the Yesh Ayin Yesh Hemshech in, from Tafesh Ayin Vav in Tzadik Dal in 1933-34. The Rebbe in Tafshin Tezvav, which is the year we're learning, the end of 1954, the beginning of 1955, uh, said Hemshech of Maimorim, a series of Maimorim on that same topic. But the Rebbe added things or, or expanded certain aspects and contracted certain other aspects, making his series on Yesha and Yesh quite different from the Yesha and Yesh you have in the early Yerabeim. And the great addition, the big thing that the Rebbe added to the Sugi of Yesh and Yesh is this whole thing of Nes and Teva. Nature versus a miracle and different levels of miracles, different levels of nature, as we discussed at length in the last uh, two classes, the last two my modern, the last two my modern. So the first two Maimorim of this series, which were unedited, focused on Yesh, Ayin, Yesh. The next two Maimorim, for the most part, spoke, focused on how Yesh, Ayin, Yesh correlates with the topic of Nes and Teva. This Maimim no longer discusses Nes and Teva. This Maimim again goes back to the sugya of Yesh, Ayin, Yesh, as it is in the first two Maimorim. But there's an unusual emphasis here. And I'm not certain whether this unusual emphasis has precedent. In other words, it's possible that what the Rebbe is going to do here um, is say something that's beyond what the earlier Rabbeim said about the topic of Yesha and Yesh. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. Okay, a little bit, I already touched on this in the last class, which was our fourth class on the Bible before this. But... Um, we're starting a new Maimed, and I really want to start this Maimed so it has a certain degree of independence from the f- previous Maimed. So I'm not going to go back and link it to the last Maimed, but this is the novel idea. The way the topic of Yesh, I, and Yesh goes is that it starts off with an idea of Yesh, I, and Yesh, right? Yesh, I, and Yesh is not only a mystical concept, it's a philosophical concept. The phys- phys- philosophical concept says this. What is a yesh? A yesh means an independent being. Or to say it in more psychological terms, a yesh means a being whose center is self. That's what yesh means. The center of my reality is me. Now, the very nature of yeshus, the very nature of self-centricity, the very nature of the idea that the center of my being is me, is that it precludes a second yesh. There's no room for two yeshs in one space. In other words, a yesh cannot begat another yesh. If a yesh creates a second yesh, the second yesh will simply be a continuation of the first. If yesh means self-centricity and independence, anything that comes from that yesh is going to be the same yesh. So if there is a being that's identified as independent, that creates another being, that other being is not a new yesh, it's more of the earlier yesh. This is a philosophical idea, and it's, it's quite logical, right? Like, to give you an example, um, parents bring children into the world. When children are little, children don't have yeshus. They have no independence, they have no self-identity. Their entire self-identity is their parents. That's why when a little child says, I'm going home, I'm going to give you my phone number, let me tell you my address, it's not their home, it's not their phone, it's not their address, it's their parents' phone, home, and address. And nevertheless, the child associates with his parents because the self-identity of that child is in his or hers, it's his parents'. Now, if that child grew up and continued living in his parents' home, and I don't only mean this geographically and physically, I mean this psychologically, as big as they would become, they would still say, my home, my phone number, my address, and mean their parents because they would never individuate, they would never become separate. Because when a yesh creates another yesh, which is a continuation of the original yesh, it continues to be the first yesh. Unless there's an interruption. One yesh has to end. And when, when one yesh ends, there's room for a second yesh to begin. That's called ayin yesh, ayin yesh. 
in order for a second entity to exist that should be independent and that should identify with itself as a center rather than its, the first yesh being its center to individuate, not to identify as a continuation of the yesh that begot it, that gave birth to it, but to identify with itself as a yesh has to be an interruption. Yesh, I and yesh. And if there's no interruption, the second yesh is not another yesh, it's a continuation of the first. And again, using child rearing as a model, when children grow up, this is one of the things that needs to happen in order for a child to stop identifying with his parents and seeing his whole identity as a continuation of their home address and phone number, their yesh, before that child can self-identify and when he says my phone number, it means the number that belongs to him, my address and my home doesn't mean his parents, there has to be an interruption. There has to be a moment of ayin. Where the bond with the parents is in some psychological way interrupted and the self-identity of the child is yet, not yet formed. Now, of course, I mean this in the re- most refined way. I don't mean this in the, in the rebellious, uh, um, contrary way, which is culturally um, popular, particularly in America, where kibbutz of aim is really very, very uh, underemphasized. We celebrate youth and we don't respect parents, but it is true that the child does not begin to identify with himself so long as he identifies with his parents. And there is a moment where the new yesh has not yet formed and the old yesh has passed and it's called ayin. So this is not a mystical idea, this is a common sense philosophical idea that to go from a yesh to a yesh you have to have an ayin ba'ems. And of course there's the story, and I'm sure I told it to you in the earlier classes, that the previous Rebbe became a Rebbe and very shortly thereafter he became very, very ill. Terminally ill, deathly ill. And the Rogachava wrote a letter. We don't have the original of that letter, but Harav Chitek, Yudel Chitek, in his Sefer, brings a paraphrase or a quote from that letter as he remembered it from his Bacharim years in the early 1920s. It was actually the end of 1920, the beginning of 1921. And in that letter, the Rogachava wrote, Gozrani Bakech Ateyre Shali, that he's declaring with the power of Teyre that the Abishta gave him that the previous Rebbe should recover. And the previous Rebbe did recover. And he, of course, was a Rebbe. And the Rogachava commented about the illness of the previous Rebbe, the previous Rebbe, yesh v'yesh, ayin v'emtza. That before the Rebbe Rasha, before the previous Rebbe's father passed away, the previous Rebbe was a chosid, which is a yesh, which is a certain self-identity. Then when his father passes away, he became a Rebbe, which is a second yesh, which is a new self-identity. You cannot transition gradually from one to the other. You can't go from being a chaser to a rebbe in a gradual way, in, through gradations. There has to be a break. And he identified the illness as the, of the previous rebbe as the ayin, which is between one yesh and another yesh. So, if there's going to be two yesh, there has to be an ayin in between. This philosophical idea is discussed at length in mysticism, in Kabbalah. What are the two yeshes? The first yesh is Hashem, the creator of the world, who is called yesh Amitya, the yesh, the ego, that is true. And the second yesh is us, and this physical world, that's called yesh HaNivra, the created self-centered entity, the created and independent yesh. The Tzadim the Maimodim, especially in the Micha Moich of the Rebbe Marash, that the yeshes of this world is called Sheker Gomor, it's the so-called big lie. But nevertheless, the perception that we have, that reality gives us on the physical level, is that this world is independent from HaKadosh Baruch. So we apply this philosophical idea that says, Yesh, I, and Yesh. That in order for Hashem, who was a true Yesh, to create a being that should be a created Yesh, in other words, to say it should identify with itself, rather than identifying with its creator, with Hashem, that's to be an I, that's to be an interruption. Because if we went straight from the yesh of Hashem to our yesh, we would be his yesh. So yesh and yesh, ayin ba'em, to go from one yesh, this is the, the, the truth of Hashem's independence, to yesh, to a second yesh, the world's perception of self as independent, and self-identifying, between those two, there used to be an ayin in the middle. This is a mystical concept. What is that ayin? That ayin is, is the spiritual worlds. 
that ayin is alakus, godliness. The spiritual worlds and godliness don't self-identify. The spiritual worlds and godliness, though their source, they know God. Oir me'ena moir, oir is dovak in the moir, and megala the moir, and bottle to the moir, and so on. So the light of godliness is not a yesh at all. To the contrary, the light of godliness identifies only with its source, and in itself it's nothing. But the light of godliness is enough of a metzias, is enough of a form to be, so to speak, a barrier between the first yesh and the second yesh. Or to say it in other words, and in plain words, and in simple words, the way Hashem created the physical world is that it's a yesh meyayin. The reason this world relates to itself, self-identifies as a yesh, is because its source is hidden from it. The only reason Elam Hazen and the creations in Elam Hazen, including each person, has a self-centricity, we identify with ourselves, we have the word I, and we mean ourselves and not our Creator, is because our Creator is hidden from us. The Creator is hidden from His creation. Like parents who are out of the picture to give space for their children to become an independent, a new generation. This is called yesh, ayin yesh. In order for the second yesh to emerge from the first yesh, it has to be a, an interruption. It's being ayin ba'ems. And like I said, this idea is not only mystical, it's actually philosophical, it's logical. So Chassidus comes along and says that even though in general it's yesh, ayin yesh, specifically it's yesh, ayin, ayin yesh. There's two ayins. There is the ayin, which is close to the first yesh, the yesh amiti, which is Hashem. And there's the ayin, which is closer to the second yesh, the yesh anivri, which is us. And there's a long discussion in Hasidus. We've been sitting on this all winter. I don't know how many classes we've had on this hemshech, but it's been many. We've done four my modem on it. That explain the need for two ayin. It's not enough to say yesh, ayin, yesh. It has to be yesh, ayin, ayin, yesh. Why? Why? Because the word ayin has two meanings. The word ayin can relate to the first yesh. And the word ayin can relate to the second yesh. And there's a huge difference between how the ayin, the word ayin relates to the first yesh and the word ayin relates to the second yesh. When the word ayin relates to the first yesh, the emphasis on the word ayin is its nothingness in comparison to the first yesh. When the ayin is relating to the second yesh, it's exactly the opposite. It's called ayin because it's beyond the comprehension and beyond the awareness of the second yesh. So the word is the same, ayin. The concept is very, very, very different. When you're discussing ayin in context of God, ayin means nothing, insignificant, of no value, relatively speaking. When you're discussing ayin in the context of the second yesh, it's supreme value. It's, it's greater than the yesh which is going to come from it. It's simply called ayin because they don't know what it is. It's beyond their comprehension. Built in Muslim. So the Maimodim say, although we start off with three concepts, yesh, ayin, yesh, we divide the three into four, yesh, ayin, ayin, yesh. There is how the ayin associates with the first yesh, which means that it's nothing compared to Hashem. There is the ayin as it relates to the second yesh. That means it's mysterious and unknown and secret from the second yesh. And it's actually two levels. And if you have been with, with us on this journey, particularly the first maimed of this hemshech, and to some extent the second maimed of this hemshech, you know that it's not just two interpretations of the same thing, it's two different levels. When you speak about ayin in conjunction with the first yesh, you're talking about the very highest levels of ein seif. When you're talking about ayin, in conjunction with the second yesh, you're talking about Malchus of Atzilus. You're talking about Alakus, which is very close to the world. Or as I mentioned in the last class, it's the mocker of the world, the source for the world. And if you were here in the previous class, which we gave last week, you know that we discussed at length the meaning of the word mocker, source. And the meaning of the word source is that not only does something come from a source, but the source is identified by the fact that something comes from it. When something comes from a source and the source is close, the source is completed by what radiates from it. Just as the offspring needs the parent, the parent is completed by the offspring. So the second ayin is a mucker, is a source for the world. 
And the first ayin is not a source for the worlds at all. It's the ain safe that in the presence of Atzavos, in the presence of the first yesh, in the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is nothing. So three becomes four. That's how this maimer develops. You start off with yesh, ayin, yesh, and I discussed a little bit what that means, and then you, you journey from there to yesh, ayin, ayin, yesh, and there's a long discussion with so many examples, what's the first ayin, what's the second ayin, first it's kalim, and then it's ayin, and then it's atzilas, and then it's ain saif, and then it's ain saif, and then it's kav, and then it's kav, and then it's lifnei atzimtzum. We went through all of these things in the previous classes. Now you get to our maimer. Bottom of page, samachalaf. And again, I already touched on this, the Rebbe already touched on it in the previous maimer, about baruch sha'asa nisim, and he made this point to some extent, that after we diverge, we reconverge. We start off with three concepts, yesh, ayin, yesh. Then we say the three have to be made into four, yesh, ayin, ayin, yesh. In our mind, right here, on the bottom page, Samachaf, the Rebbe is going to change his mind. And he's going to say, you know, remember I told you that there's yesh, ayin, ayin, yesh. In truth, there's only one ayin. It's not yesh, ayin, ayin, yesh. It's yet ayin, yesh. What about the fact that we divided the ayin into two. So the Rebbe is going to say that it's not two ayins, it's two aspects of the same ayin. And there are certain uh, practical reasons, intellectual reasons, reasons of explanation, utilitarian reasons for explaining the ayins as two, but actually it's only one. Again, I'm going to say it one more time, but I'll say it without any philosophy, just statements. We started off with an idea, with an assumption that there's three concepts, yesh, ayin, yesh. We developed that into another idea that is yesh, ayin, ayin, yesh. And now we're going to further develop by saying that it's actually only yesh, ayin, yesh. The two ayins are one and the same. And this is what we're going to be learning in today's class. Now, I want to teach this to you in a way that will be clear to you. My, my function, my role, my job is to teach, right? Not to sit here and say philosophy that will make me feel good, but hopefully it will give you some enlightenment and some clarity. So the way I want to do this is I want to go to page Samach Beis, actually, and read from approximately the middle of the page the line that begins with the word Yodua. It's the first paragraph on page Samach Beis. Um, it's a, like I said, it's about the middle of the page. The line begins with the word Yedua HaMoshal Al Tzimtzum Harishan. Now, the reason I'm starting here is because this is a very, very helpful form to understand what the Rebbe is doing. It's not going to explain why the Rebbe is doing what he's doing but it will explain what the Rebbe is doing. And what the Rebbe is doing is going full circle. We started off with yesh, ayin, yesh. We very quickly evolved into yesh, ayin, ayin, yesh. And now we're evolving again back to the original form of yesh, ayin, yesh. There's only one ayin. There's no two yeshes. And in order to do this, the Rebbe illustrates it with the Rav Talmud scenario, teacher-student scenario. So we're going to first read the Marshal and hopefully explain it with the grace and help of God I'll explain it to, with some degree of clarity, and then we'll go back and learn uh, the Haskalah, the Nimshal, how it is, Lamaila. So let's begin. You have a teacher and a student. A teacher is a person, and a student is a person. And I hope, I hope we can all agree that a human being is far, much, far more than a mind. A human being is more complex than a mind, uh, a human being is more expansive than a mind. And more importantly, a human being is much deeper than a mind. But the brain, the mind, the intellect of the person is one of the many components that makes up a person. And it's actually one of the most important. So we have a teacher. That's a person. We'll call him a yesh. You have a student who's also a person. We'll call him a yesh. The bond between this yesh and this yesh is ideas, is intellect. Now, of course, the point that has to be made is that the intellect, which is in between person A and person B, is relative to both ayin. Because if the information that the teacher is teaching the student is a yesh, then the student is not a separate person. 
he's a continuation of his teacher. And if you want an illustration for this, imagine a human being who's a parrot, doesn't understand anything his teacher says, and just repeats verbatim everything the teacher says. A teacher talks, a student hears, and repeats it. That's not another idea. It's not a new concept. It's not a new world. It is a direct continuation of the teacher to such an extent that even though it's another physical body, it's the same yesh. But because the teacher is not simply saying words and the student is repeating them. The teacher is communicating an idea and the student is processing it and making it his own. And when he says it, it's his. It's yesh and yesh and ayin ba'emtsa. The idea which is in between the teacher and the student is ayin relative to both of them. From the teacher's perspective, his ideas don't amount to what he is. A human being is far more than all of his knowledge. And from the perspective of the student, it's because no matter how much the student understands what the teacher wants to teach, it's insignificant compared to what the teacher is. And what he knows is ayin is insignificant. I, I want to say it differently. Is ayin is not fully understood by the student. So when a student's teacher relationship, a teacher-student relationship, the teacher would be the first yesh, the student would be the second yesh, and in between be ayin. But, intellectually, there's a lot of levels. Assuming that the teacher is a super-intellectual, is far superior intellectually to his student, to the degree that there is a chasm, there is a divide between their intellectual abilities that is unbridgeable. The teacher has to find language and form in order to teach the student. So you're going to have two ions. You're going to have the teacher, that will be the first yesh, you're going to have the understanding of the teacher as it is in relationship with the teacher, per se. That will be the first ayin. And then you're going to have the level of understanding which the teacher actually imparts to the student, which the student then processes. So that's how three becomes four, right? Yesh is teacher. Yesh is student. Ayin is ideas in between. Yesh is teacher. Yesh is student. And there's two ayans. The ayan means the intellect of the teacher on the teacher's level, and the second ayan means the intellect of the student on the student, the intellect of the teacher on the student's level. So the Rebbe's assertion at this point of the Hemshech has to say, by the way, when we divide yesh, ayan, yesh into yesh, ayan, ayan, yesh, it's really only one ayan. Why? Because there's a person called a teacher. From that teacher radiates ideas. All the ideas of the teacher are one essence of ayin. They're an emergence from the teacher. They come from the teacher. They aren't the teacher himself. Relative to the teacher, they're nothing. And they're the basis of everything a teacher is going to teach students. The fact that the ayin is later divided into two is not because there's two ayins, but because there's many levels in that ayin. And this is how the Rebbe is going to argue that the subject which starts out as yesh, ayin, yesh, and then divides into yesh, ayin, ayin, yesh, is now going to be reunified in the concept of yesh, ayin, yesh. Let's read it inside. Yadua ha-moshol al Everybody knows one of the classic illustrations, misholim, analogies, examples in Hasidus, is the first symptom. What is the moshol? Shu kamei bera v'tal We're talking about teachers and students but not where the distance between the teacher and the student is measurable, relative. Or to say it in practical terms, the teacher is simply older and has more information. The student is simply younger and has less information. And the teacher is giving the student information. But the teacher is far more intelligent. And the student is far less intelligent. And the teacher is capable of understanding things which we'd have a very, very difficult time explaining to a student altogether. This is called Ravet Talmud then, when this teacher, who we're calling Yesh, number one, has ideas, which we're going to call the ayin of the Yesh, and he wants to take from the ideas as he understands them, and create an idea which is close enough for the student who's on a much, much lower level to also understand, you have to have an interruption. A tzimtzum. What is the marshal for tzimtzum? 
the teacher has to first pull himself back, to totally remove his intellect, and only then will it emerge from within this teacher, the idea is that the student is able to relate to. In other words, there's a concept when a teacher and a student are infinitely separated, they're quantum removed, this teacher has to stop thinking, completely stop thinking, shut his brain down. Because as long as he thinks, he's thinking in his level, in his world. And his level, in his world, is so far removed from the world and the level of the student, there's no relativism, there's no closeness whatsoever. What happens when the teacher turns off his brain completely? He can pay attention to the student. And he can philosophically or psychologically hear the student. And of course, hearing the student means hearing the world of the student, the way the student's world works. And when the teacher hears the student, he develops a sense of how the student thinks and reasons. Then later, when he turns his brain back on, when it goes back to the knowledge that he has, he's able to find the language and the form to speak to the student. So the only way a teacher will discover the extent to which his student is inferior to him and be able to find language and form and subject, subject and substance, substance, which he can share with this much lower student is by turning off his brain completely. So the idea the teacher has it is the ayin of the first yesh. The idea as the teacher teaches it to the student is the ayin of the second yesh. And in between there has to be an interruption. So we start off with one ayin, yesh, ayin, yesh, and then we develop it into two ayins, yesh, ayin, ayin, yesh. Says the Rebbe, I want to tell you something, Uba Emes, to be sure. You must understand that this phenomena, that a teacher has ideas, it's called the ayin of the yesh ha'amiti, and then he turns off his brain completely, and then when he turns it back on, he's able to relate to the level of intellect of the student, which is called the ayin of the yesh ha'nivra. Says the Rebbe, this does not mean that when the teacher turns off his brain, the act of turning off his brain gives him information, gives him new ideas. Because turning off your brain gives you nothing. Shutting down your mind does not create a different kind of intellect, it creates nothing. So if a teacher is so smart that he can't relate to his students, in order to be able to relate to his students, just to totally shut down his brain, nothing new is created. If nothing new is created, how does he have information to give to the student? So the Rebbe continues and he says, Ki im, but rather the truth is, In the mind of the teacher, as the teacher is by himself, the ayin of the Yesh Ha'amiti, there already is hidden very deeply in the supreme and superior intellect of the teacher, the level of these concepts which the student can relate to, before the interruption, this lower level of intellect was included in the superior, the supreme intellect of the teacher. In other words, when a person is very, very smart and wants to relate to people who are far less intelligent, and in order to do that, he can't simply dilute his knowledge, but he has to stop himself and start up. It's not like that in the event of stopping himself and starting up, he's creating new ideas. It's that in his original thought process. There already was the possibility to teach the student, but he needs to retrieve it, needs to separate it from how he thinks. In other words, if you understand something at a very abstract level, hidden in that abstraction is a more applied level, and an even more applied level. But as an intellectual relates to the idea at an abstract level, he doesn't sense, he doesn't appreciate that hidden within it is the applied level. So, even though we're making it into two ayans, yesh, ayan, ayan, yesh, the first ayan meaning the intellect as the teacher understands it, and the second ayan means the intellect is able to teach it to the student, it's really the same. Because the information the teacher teaches the student is actually a part of what the teacher knows. It's simply been separated out through the event of tzimtzum. So though we start off by saying yesh, ayan, ayan, yesh, to be sure the two ayans are actually the same ayin which is divided up in two through an event of tzimtzum. But even after the tzimtzum, it's really the same. So the Rebbe continues. tzimtzum poil, the effect of the tzimtzum effect, that there is a separation between the ideas in the level of the brain of the teacher, which only the teacher can understand, 
And the idea is in the level of the t- brain of the teacher, which the student can be able to relate to. And by stopping and starting, you're separating the chitzenius from the pnimius, but you're not creating the chitzenius. The chitzenius was a part of the pnimius. In other words, whatever the teacher teaches the student is a part of what the teacher knows. And because everything that the teacher teaches the student is part of what the teacher knows, it's part of the original ayin. We call them two ayins because there's an interruption. There is the seichel arav, there's a tzimtzum, and there's madrege seichel talmud. But in reality, the tzimtzum simply helps bring forward the second ayin from the first ayin, but it's actually part and parcel of the first ayin. So this is a full circle discussion. You start off with yesh ayin yesh, you develop it into yesh ayin ayin yesh, and now the Rebbe insists on going back to the original model that it's only yesh ayin yesh. The separation which happens through the tzimtzum is to separate the way the teacher understands things on a level where only he can understand it and the way the teacher understands things, the same information, but on a level where he's able to explain it to the student. The level of intellect as it relates to the student should not be overwhelmed by the superior and supreme intellect of the teacher and he can't access it in order to be able to teach and here's the conclusion with three lines from the end of the first paragraph on page Samar Beis. Even the level of intellect which the teacher teaches, the student, is a part of what the teacher himself is. If the teacher is the first yesh, and ideas are the ayin of that first yesh, every idea is the ayin of that first yesh, including the idea that is actually going to teach a student. So why do we call it a second ayin? Because the emergence of what the teacher teaches the student is through a tzimtzum. But the tzimtzum isn't creating the second ayin, it's simply separating the first ayin from the second ayin because originally both ayins were the same, one and the same. So we go full circle. The emergence of the second ayin, from the first ayin, is through tzimtzum, but the tzimtzum isn't creating a new phenomena, a new ayin, it's simply separating it out. Says the book, making you even lamailas, and can be explained when you talk about a lakus. Shagam ha ayin chalayesha nivra, even the ayin which is close to the creation, bomitad ha etzam atzme, is not, the second ayin isn't created from the first ayin, the second ayin is created from the ebishter, just like the first ayin is created from the ebishter. Hashem produces oir. And that oir is called ein safe, and that oir is me'ein amoir. In that oir you have everything, including malchus of atzils, which is a mocker to the lower worlds. So the oir ain't safe which is a reflection of Hashem, Kvayach, has no relationship with the world. Malchus of Atzilus is called a mocker, a source for the world, it's close to the world, it's defined by the world, it's given purpose and completed by the world, and so on. But Malchus of Atzilus, which is the second ayin, is really part and parcel of the original ayin. Because there's an Eibish there, there is Eir. Included in Eir, there are all levels, including the Eir, which can be a mocker for Elamis. So, even though we call them two ions, they're only two ions on some philosophical level. In reality, both ions are one and the same. They are a radiation of what Hashem is. Vidavag bites attached to it. Elish is galus and yatsimtsum. We call it two ions because it's separated out through tsimtsum uh, edition. So, this marshal of a teacher and a student, in Hebrew we call it the Rav and Talmud, helps illustrate that what we're calling two ions is actually. Two levels of the same ayin. There's Hashem and there's Oyer. Oyer includes everything, including the worlds. So the highest level of Oyer and the lowest levels of Oyer all exist together. Then there's a Tzimtzum which separates out the lower levels of Oyer from the higher levels of Oyer. But when you have a Tzimtzum which separates out the lower levels of Oyer from the higher levels of Oyer, you're not creating a new Oyer. You're simply developing that first Oyer. So therefore what we did call two ayins, we're now going to again call one ayin. Everything that comes from Hashem before the yeshas of this world is ayin. But you need to understand to develop this idea a little bit more. Because the two words ayin are different meanings. The first meaning of the word ayin means that you're nothing in the presence of Hashem. The ayin, the second ayin means ayin that you're beyond the comprehension of the second yesh. If it's true that the two ions are really one, that means the second ion also can be defined by the definition we gave for the first ion. 
that the first ayin we defined as ayin nothing in the presence of Hashem, the second ayin which is a makkah for elamis, which is called a mitzias, which has its self identity to be a source for creation, is also ayin, is also insignificant and nothing in the, in the, in the presence of HaKadosh Baruch. So by going from four back to three, what we're doing is that we're saying that both definitions of ayin apply to both levels of ayin. The first definition of ayin is that you're nothing in the presence of Hashem. It applies even to the second ayin, which is a metzias and a mokah for elemis. And the second edition of ayin, which means built in musik, is beyond our comprehension, applies to the first level of ayin as well, which is the ain't safe. So the Rebbe has gone full circle. We're back to one ayin. We started with of yesh ayin yesh. We divided it up into yesh ayin ayin yesh. And now we're saying there's only one ayin. What does ayin mean? Two things. I come from Hashem. I'm, I'm insignificant in the presence of Hashem. And I'm a source for worlds. Both of these insights are included in both levels of I. I come from Hashem and in the presence of Hashem I'm insignificant and my identity is hidden from and a source for what the worlds are going to be. The, the lower ayin also has the malas apital and the higher ayin also has the idea that it's a mocha for elemis. Okay? In other words, there's a tzimtzum which separates the air from Lifni at Simpson, the air from Lachar at Simpson, that makes the air Lachar at Simpson a Matthias. But even when the air Lachar at Simpson becomes a Matthias, it's really still the same as air Lifni at Simpson because of the Vekas. And the air Lifni at Simpson already has the Shaykhist to Matthias, as it's going to be after the Simpson, by the virtue of the fact that it's air and not more. So now, let's go back and read from the bottom of page Samachal. Who, and, and then we're going to go straight. Okay? I'm, I'm, of course, I'm not going to reread the marshal, but we'll go now in order. He near to its well known Sheshtam Dalad Madrigas. There's four levels. Yesh, Ayin, Ayin, Yesh. Yesh means Hashem, truly independent, whose self centricity is true. Yesh, Hanivra, whose self centricity and independence is a lie. And in between those two, there's two Ayins. In the last Maimir, we mentioned, and the Rebbe mentioned it, Baha'u Law, in that very complicated fourth Shia that I gave you, that the four are really three. Which means in the second ayin is also the bittle of Klok Shiv, like in the first ayin. Yesh, ayin v'yesh. The first yesh should be Hashem, the second yesh should be the world, and ayin would be all levels of Alakus, from the levels of Alakus, like Nea Tzimtzum until Caleb and Malchus of Atzilas, are one and the same ayin. Ella, it is only the phenomena that something emerges from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which is revealing HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and battled HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and so on, is Ayin in comparison with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and that's all there is, and we divide it into two. Ayin, Shela, Yesh, Hamiti, that Ayin, as it relates to the first Yesh, which makes it nothing compared to Hashem. The Ayin, Shela, Yesh, Hanivra, this Ayin, as it relates to the second Yesh, which makes it a Mokha for it makes it a Hefshari HaMetzias, a Hiyuli for creation. Says the Rebbe Adik, was that the point of this is Sha'ayin Habeis. When we speak about a first and a second ayin, Ha'ayin Shaliyeh Shanivra, Eini Ha'odam Ayin Aleph. We're not saying that the second ayin is a creation or even a radiation of the first. It's not two things. The second ayin is not a creation of the first ayin. The second ayin is a part of the first ayin which is separated out. Ha'ayin Shaliyeh Shanivra, Ela Shenim Shneim, Nem Shach Mehatzim. Both levels of ayin relate directly to the Ebishta, to Yesh. Both are connected to the Yesh, to the Eibishter. And in, to some degree at least, both are connected to the Eibishter in a revealed way. This one ayin, which is coming from Hashem and nothing in comparison with Him, and going to the world and beyond the comprehension of the world in relationship with the worlds, are really one and the same thing. And they're divided up in two so to speak, for practical reasons. For Hainu, this means the Ayin, as it emerges from the Ebishter, which is one with the Ebishter, Nechla Kulishnaim. It's divided up into two. The Mitzad, the Ayin, Atzme, in as much as the Ayin is by itself, Yeshpe, Mashahu, Ayin, Shalha Yeshua, Miti, Shu, Ayin, Be'emes. In as much as this godliness is relating to what it is, its godliness. It's nothing compared to the Yesha Amiti. The Yesh Be Mashahu Ayin Shala Yesha Niv, at the very, very same time, that same Ayin has a phenomenon of being a source for the worlds. 
And here with She'ene Ayin Be'emes, when the Ayin is source of the world, it's not totally battle to Hashem because it's a Metzias of a Mokr for Elamis. V'nikra Ayin Rak Mitzad Zeh She'ene Musig. It's not called Ayin because it's nothing. Like the first Ayin, it's called Ayin because it's beyond comprehension like the second Ayin. So there's really one Ayin. And when you're looking at it from the Abish's perspective, Ayin means nothing compared to Hashem. You're looking at the very same ayin from the perspective of the world. Ayin means beyond the comprehension of the creations. Even the second ayin, which is a mokra for elam, is bo mitad it relates directly to the eibishter and not to a higher air. Shezel ayin at nechel shleim, which is the meaning of the idea that the ayin is divided in two, because the second ayin is not an offspring of the first ayin. The second ayin is an offspring of the very same as the first ayin, which is atzmos. Vehine. So, if yesh ayin ayin yesh is really yesh ayin yesh, there's only one ayin. So, how can we speak about two? Says Rebbe Be'inyin zesh ayin nechak l'shnayim. The reason we take this one ayin and divide it up into two, although ultimately it's really one, is had a high schal because bepel shabayz bechinas ayin are the ayin simsim because there's a need for a division in that ayin, and the purpose. For the division that I is to create a tzimtzum, an interruption, and a renewal to create the possibility of being mashpia to the other worlds. So there has to be a tzimtzum, which stops the oid of the first ayin and allows the emergence of the oid of the second ayin. But the oid of the second ayin is not the child of the first ayin. The oid of the, of the second ayin is, is the child of the original moir, original mother. It's only that it's divided through the tzimtzum. Hainu shah tzimtzum pale. His chalkos be'efel agilah shlem kanal. The symptom effects that when you look at the light, you'll see two levels of light because the two levels might have been separated. And of course, the higher level of light reveals more of the source, and the lower level of light reveals less of the source. The way they are connected to their source, and as you know, we talked about this earlier in this Hemshech, the meaning of the word Vegas means a being that has no self-identity other than the fact that it's reflecting its source. So there's two levels of ayat that are separate from one another in terms of how they reveal, reveal Godliness and their source. And there's two levels of ayin that are different in how they're connected to their source. What's the difference? The higher ayin is, is dveikos, is reflecting Hashem in a way that you can see that it's reflecting Hashem. The second ayin is a dveikos built in a Even though it's also attached to HaKadosh Baruch it isn't so evident and so visible and so obvious. On the Merakai's Chalkas Bepeil, he shabbat at him. So, this separation, where the first ayin is closer to Hashem and the second ayin is further from Hashem, the first ayin is the ayin of the Esh, is, is in a way of Dvekus. And the second ayin is a way of Dvekus built in Nikeres. That's only how it is in actuality. Shabbat at him. Avob Emes, to be sure, he na ayin atzmin nechel shaim. It's really one ayin which is divided up into two. So we speak about yesh, ayin, ayin, yesh, because we need to. It's helpful for us. It's practically an advantage. But in truth, it's one ayin. Whatever comes from the Eibishter is nothing compared to the Eibishter, and directly or indirectly is a source for the creation. So the same malakus is ayin on this level and ayin on this level. Why is this important? So let me say this first. I want to say this first. When we learned the first mime on this Hemshech, I, so to speak, led a, a lot of ground rules for what this Hemshech is going to develop. And one of the things that I touched on is the terms Dveikos Nikeres and Dveikos Bilti Nikeres. But in that discussion, Dveikos Nikeres and Dveikos Bilti Nikeres applied to Eir and Keli. Here the Rebbe is using the terms Dveikos Nikeres not in conjunction with Eir and Keli, but in conjunction with Eir and Saif and the Eir of Atzilus, Eir of Elimus. This is Dveikas Nikeres, and this is Dveikas built in Nikeres. So I just want to mention that it says in Samach Vov that all Eir, all levels of Eir Ein Saif, from the highest level to the lowest level, are the same basically. Every level of godliness shares the fact that it's Ein Saif. In other words, every quality, like Kvayachal, the Eibishter has, the Eir has, which means Sfirah is Ein Kate. And in addition to everything that there is in the Lakus, there is in the Sfirah, There is the idea that all levels of Elakus are one with Ein Seif. In other words, even though there's so many levels of Ein Seif, there's Ein Seif Shalifni at Simpson, there's Ein Seif Shalachar at Simpson, 
In Eden says Shlifni at Simsum there's etzem and ispashtas and a lower level is pashtas. In Lachar at Simsum also there's innumerable levels of oyer. So two things are true. That all the levels of oyer are like the highest level of oyer in their bittle to the source. And all levels of oyer are like the lowest level of oyer that they're, they're a metzias of oyer they can have a relationship with the worlds. And the point is that even the lowest level of Eid ain't safe is ain't safe. And even the lowest level of Eid ain't safe is dveikus. The lower level of ain't safe is godliness, has no self-identity, has no ego, it's ayin. Even though relative to the higher madrigas, it's very close to the creation. So the Rebbe makes the argument that even though there's so many levels of Elokus, the lowest level of Elokus and the highest level of Elokus share their basic properties. They're nothing in relationship with Hashem. They reveal everything of what Hashem is and ultimately the only resource for Elohim is. And as I was saying, what would be the difference between the Eidin Seif Lifni at Simtum and the Eidin Seif Lachar at Simtum? So I saw in Samach Vav that all the Madregas of Eidin Seif Lachar at Simtum have Histalkos and Hispashtos, have emotion. Motion, not emotion, but motion, up and down. Getting close to Hashem and getting separated from the Ebishter. Because beginning after the Tzimtzum, there's some kind of a concept of Mokim. And therefore the Oyed is a Ratzai V'Sheif. The Eid and Seif Shlifnei Tzimtzum is also in a state of Ratzai V'Sheif, also in a state of Vekas, but there's no Estalkas and Espashtas, because there's no place to go. So both of them are Oyed. Both of them are connected to the Ebishter. Both of them are connected to the Ebishter in a way of Vekas. Yet relative to La'achar HaTzimtzum, Lifni HaTzimtzum is, is a much higher Dveikas. Relative to Lifni HaTzimtzum, the Dveikas, Achar HaTzimtzum is called Bilti Nikid. You can't see the truth if it's connected to the Eibishter, because it's connected to the Eibishter in two steps, in a Siluk, and a Spashtos, and a Rotsi, and a Shei. Says the Rebbe, you have all of these differences, but these differences are only in how you come close to the world. But in terms of how they emerge from the Eibishter, what emerges from Atzimus is all Madregas of Eid, from the highest Madregas to the lowest Madregas. So the Rebbe's point is going to be that you have many levels of godliness. The lowest level of godliness is Atzilus. The lowest level of godliness is Kav, which is La'achar Atzimt. You should know all these levels of godliness are really one and the same, notwithstanding that there's a symptom that separates between one and the next. And that's what the Rebbe says in the bottom of page Samach Beis. Vezehu Mashin is Bayer, which explains what we discussed also in the first Maimon, I believe. Binyan Kav. The Kav is the alien Sof, which comes from before the symptom to after the symptom to measure the worlds, to rule the worlds, to, to bring the worlds to a measure, which is in from a deed of Akbal, it's in from the On the other hand, the Kav is a Gili of Ainsef Shlafniyat Simtsum. So the Kav has two opposites its aspect of measuring and its aspect of being Ainsef. And because the Kav has these two aspects, we say about the Kav that even as it is after the symptom, it's Chazav Ehe like the Ainsef Shlafniyat Simtsum. Even though the kav comes from before the symptom to after the symptom, with the way of interruption, and the difference between before the symptom and after the symptom is before the symptom, the eight is so one with Hashem, there isn't even a movement. And after the symptom, the eight has enough separation from Hashem that you have to have a tnu of Ratzi Vashev and so forth and so on. Says the Rebbe Vatim, Tomerishin Davko Babchina Seal, the first symptom totally separates and starts over, Mikomo comes still. When the kav comes after the tzimtzum. We don't say the tzimtzum creates it. When the kav comes after the tzimtzum, we say that the oil of lifni tzimtzum breaks through the tzimtzum and comes liachar tzimtzum. It passes through the tzimtzum. Says the Rebbe Lachain, therefore, who bedveikas Even godliness after the tzimtzum is still attached to the eibishter and ultimately it's still attached to the eibishter like they didn't say lifni tzimtzum. So we divide it into two ayins. And we consider the second ayin farther away from the truth than the first ayin. But this difference is only, if you will, superficial. It's only in the development of the ayin to be able to create the second yesh. But in terms of what it is, all of the aspects of Eidin Seif is really the ayin which comes from Hashem. So now the Rebbe gets to his point. And you know what, let me read the words and explain them and I'll tell you the point momentarily. Kmeikein hu... Yuvan gambin yin atzilas. Just like we understand about the kav lachar atzimtzum, that even though it goes through the tzimtzum, it's chaz of ehayir, atzilas, which is most, even much lower than the kav, is also the same thing. The after hu ayadeh atzimtzum, the atzilas comes through a tzimtzum. And it actually comes through much more tzimtzum than the kav does, right? Atzilas is ayadeh bekelim. 
the real reason for Timtum Adishin was because of Atilas. The Parse is for Bishel Elm is Bia. And the Tim of Shil Elm Atilas says that Rebbe Makam will come over to Vegas. Atilas is after the Timtum, but as it is after the Timtum, it's in a state of Vegas. And the Rebbe explains, the concept is as follows. Says the Rebbe, the idea is as follows. The Hine. When Hasidus takes the one ayin and splits it into two, they do it all over his Shalos. You have ayin shalayesh hamiti and ayin shashanivra, right? We divide ayin into two. Says Rebbe, pay attention. Yesh kama bayurim. Go back to the first maimed of this hemshech. In other words, go back to page yud beis and then yud gimel. And then your Dalit, and particularly your Dalit, and Tezvov, and so on, and Tezayin, and your Zayin, and then I guess also in a different way in the second Maim of Hemshech, and you'll make a very interesting discovery. There's Yesh, Ayin, Ayin, Yesh, but where the two Ayins are situated in Hishtalshlus, as we understand it, there's all kinds of explanations. In the first explanation, or one of the explanations, the first eye and the second eye are both before the tzimtz. Right? Vehem etza mervis pasha said. Beer a beis, another explanation. She beis bechines ayin heim ha'ed, k'mesha kedem a tzimtzum v'hakav. The second explanation is that the first eye is before the tzimtzum, and the second eye is after the tzimtzum. But then there's beer a gimel. She beis bechines ayin heim ha'ed, she kedem a tzilas v'atzilas. The two eye are both after the tzimtzum. Now, if we hold that the tzimtzum is not only stopping the first ayin, but creating a new ayin, how could they both exist before the tzimtzum? How could they both exist after the tzimtzum? Which proves what? That although we divide the ayin into two ayins, it's really not that the second ayin comes from the first ayin. The second ayin comes from the first yesh, just like the first ayin comes from the first yesh. Because it's really one idea. It's divided up in terms of coming closer to the world's. But it goes both ways. That the second ayin, which is close to the world, is like the first ayin in its bittle. And even the first ayin, which is completely removed from the world, relative to the yesh hamiti, has an indirect relationship with the metzias of the world. So atzilus, as low as it is in quotations, in the schemes of levels of ain't safe, is ultimately ayin. Ayin means in the presence of yesh hamiti and nothing in comparison with him. Valchain therefore, hine, shame just as shall habir shahayan shall yesha nivru kav. Just like when we understand that the kav, even though it goes through the tzimtzum, haria tzimtzum ene pale be li yes muvdal. The tzimtzum does not affect that the kav should be a new creation. Elagam achara tzimtzum advekas, even after the tzimtzum, it's advekas. In the tzimtzum shall fnea tzimtzum, except that it's a different kind of advekas. Same is true about Atzilus. That after Atzilus, boy, they are Tzimtzum. Even though Atzilus comes through the Tzimtzum edition, he nishar shehu ba'etzim. Atzilus, even though it's a revelation of godliness, and as godliness that it comes into vessels, etc., 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 you should know it's coming directly from Hashem Himself. Lachainu bedvekas bicha etzem. The dvekas of atzilus is not in the level of oyer higher than itself, or the level of oyer too higher than itself. The dvekas of atzilus is in the avish to himself. Shazel shatzilus im loshin etzle v'samach, which is why we call atzilus near Hakadosh Baruch. And we're going to stop now. So in Kamos we learned very little. We learned an omad and a half sachakol. But in this omad and a half we learned an idea that the Rebbe wants to underscore. That although we divide yesh, ayin, yesh, into yesh, ayin, ayin, yesh, even after the division of yesh, ayin, ayin, yesh, both of those ayins are really one and the same. They come from Hashem. The second ayin doesn't come from the first ayin. The second ayin comes from Hashem. Just like the first ayin comes from Hashem because all Ur emerges from yesh, amit, from atzmus. In that Ur, you have all the potential levels. And with the different levels of Ur are separated out from the original Ur, each one of them relates not to the beginning of Ur, but to the yesh, amit, to the Abishta, which is the source.